So um, the talk, as you know, is about the transformative power of slow breathing. Um, and when I say transformative, we'll see that um, breathing has the, the potential, the power to transform us physically, uh, mentally, psychologically, and emotionally, which is quite a big claim for something we just do without thinking all day long. I've been practicing uh, Qigong for 25 years odd, and before that I did yoga, and it's a vital part of my life. But then I started to ask the question, well, why is it, why is it good for me, or why is it good for us? Because uh, yoga, Tai Chi, Qigong, um, Pilates, Feldenkrais, these methods don't seem to fit in to the conventional Western scientific idea of what constitutes exercise. They're not aerobic, or they're only mildly aerobic. Why are these practices so good for um, our bodies and our minds? Well, one answer is, who cares? I, I do it, and I feel great, so um, why do I need to ask this question? But I think knowing more uh, about this subject is interesting, and that it can feed back into and deepen our practice when we understand some of what's going on. So I'm going to, uh, what I'm going to do in the next hour and a bit is um, I'm going to talk about the Chinese approach to breathing, and I think that's very relevant to uh, all the Asian practices. So it's very relevant to yoga, very relevant actually to, to all these kind of practices. Uh, but I'm going to give a Chinese perspective on them. Then I'd like us to do a bit of practice, a bit of breathing. And then I'm going to have a look at some of the science behind it and hopefully not um, put you to sleep in doing so. So the China's very good at classifying things, one reason being that they've got this wonderful tool, yin-yang, which can be used to classify so many different things. So when it comes to traditional Chinese exercise, which is mostly um, martial arts, it's the, the main tradition, they're divided into what's called waijia, that's external practice, which is more yang, and neijia, internal practice, which is more yin. And external practice uh, trains, it's the, if you've seen Shaolin monks flying through the air and whacking each other with sticks, ex external exercise trains for aerobic fitness, muscular strength, speed, agility. So at the extreme of external training, uh, we train to exhaustion, uh, sweat a lot, and so on. And most modern, I use the term Western, perhaps it's not appropriate, most modern exercise fits into this external category. Gym, sports, uh, a lot of running, high intensity interval training, hard martial arts, and increasingly, I'd say some yoga fits into this. Training to exhaustion and copious sweating, as we know, some styles of yoga. So what are the advantages? What's the benefits that we know of this kind of exercise? Well, first of all, we get aerobically fit. So we don't get particularly aerobically fit with the internal practice. Uh, good muscular development, and if we bother about what we look like, uh, can help us get very defined muscles and a fit-looking body. Um, it has a rapid and reliable effect on moving qi and blood. So what that means in Chinese terms is it rapidly promotes circulation. But it's a little bit more than um, just blood circulation. So I'd like to introduce you to the idea of stagnation. It's possible to have, from the Chinese medicine perspective, stagnation of qi and blood in the body. How does that manifest? We feel sluggish and um, 
lacking in energy, and very often it lies behind depression. So we know that aerobic exercise is very quick and very effective at transforming depression. You can feel depressed, you can go for a run, 20 minutes later you feel great. Okay. So it has a very quick effect, so rapid mood altering effects. What are the disadvantages of external practice? Well, um, it's easier to do when you're young. It tends not to be a lifelong practice. In the Chinese tradition, when you're young, you might do hard martial arts. By the time you get to about 30, you get so many injuries that you transform into internal martial arts, which I'll talk about. I'll explain what that means. Um, you can't do so much um, hard external exercise when you're injured or sick. Uh, they have a high risk of injury. Many, many people who go to gyms, um, who run, um, who do uh, some of the more extreme forms of yoga, get injured. Um, this rapid chi and blood moving and, and mood altering effect tends to be short lived. You have stagnation. You go for a run, you feel better. After a few hours, stagnation reasserts itself. Um, in excess, um, external exercise harms the health, injures the immune, weakens the immune system, and it can become addictive. Now the internal practice, or the Chinese call them the internal art. So in the Chinese tradition, this includes practices such as qigong, I'm sure everybody's heard of, of Tai Chi. Another, the other two that belong to internal practice are called Bagua and Xing Yi. I won't go into any detail about them. And um, the internal practices also embrace yoga, which the Chinese call Brahmin Qigong, um, Pilates, Alexander Technique, Feldenkrais, and more. So I imagine most people here, what we've seen, um, do internal practice. So what does it mean? What, what, is it, what is special about this idea of internal practice? Well, from the Chinese point of view, the heart of it, the essence of it, is the cultivation of three things. They are body, breath, and mind, or in the Chinese tradition, called the three treasures, Jing, Qi, and Shen. And when these are cultivated equally, um, as they are certainly in Qigong and to a large degree in yoga, they have a deep transformative effect on us. Um, I'd like to just look at body and mind briefly before we get on to breath and breathing. So in the internal practices, Qigong, Tai Chi, yoga and so on, what do we want from the body? What do we want to cultivate when we cultivate the body? We want strength, agility, um, core strength, core stability, um, balance and rootedness. This is really important, especially as we age, to, be, to have good balance. Um, fluid stretching, soft power, and relaxed muscles. These are very important in the internal martial arts rather than hard muscular power, um, full body awareness, proprioception. So you're familiar with, so proprioception is actually when, if you get caught driving while possibly under the influence of alcohol in the States, they ask you to close your eyes and touch the tip of your finger to your nose, because that's a test of proprioception. Proprioception is knowing where all the different bits of our body are in space. And again, this is something that some people struggle with and most people struggle with as they get older, unless we cultivate proprioception. And alignment, uh, left, right, alignment, top, bottom, integration, and healing. Okay? So this is already, I would say, a lot more than uh, most forms of external exercise offer. An external exercise doesn't really pay much attention to the other two aspects. It doesn't pay much attention to mind, and it doesn't pay much attention to breath. So that was body. Um, mind, 
the, the basis, the foundation of what we try and cultivate when we practice yoga or qigong is full absorption. We're fully present in the practice. In fact, we're fully present in the body and the breath. We're not in a gym, running on a treadmill, watching a film, thinking about what's going to happen next or what happened before or what we should have said, yeah, what, what our next meal is going to be. The mind is wrapped up, absorbed like water in a sponge into the breath and the body. That's the minimum requirement. Um, a Tai Chi Chuan classic from the somewhere between the 12th and 14th centuries says, um, once set in motion, the whole body is unified and must be light and filled with spirit. Spirit here um, means mind, awareness. And uh, BKS Iyengar, the famous yoga teacher, says health is awareness, not physical fitness, which flows like a river in every part of the body. So, internal practice. What are the advantages? Um, we've mentioned uh, several of them. Strength, physical strength, uh, which we need to cultivate and maintain right through into old age. If we lose strength as we get older, then our life declines significantly. Our ability to carry out normal functions declines. Core stability, um, balance, and uh, the Neja internal practices have a pro more profound effect on mental calm and stillness. They cultivate it so that instead of, um, there's some seats over there, some chairs. It, it, I mean, look, aerobic exercise is good for depression. We know that. It's very good. But it doesn't deal with the, so much with the root of mental emotional problems. Whereas cultivating um, inner stillness and calm and breathing, as we shall see, has a more powerful, long-lasting and deeper effect on changing the way we respond emotionally to the world. Um, the internal traditions have minimal risk of injury. They can be practiced at any age and have significant health benefits. Okay. So what are the disadvantages of the internal tradition? Well, they're frustra often frustratingly slow for young people. Okay. Get vigorous young 20-year-olds in a Qigong class and doing this, which we're going to do later, by the way. And they go, no, I can't bear it. They want to run and, and so on. That's natural. So it's often too slow for young people. Um, some forms of internal practice, like soft qigong, soft yoga, they don't have enough vigorous activity. Yeah? We won't, if, if all you practice is, is yoga, particularly the kind of slower and more gentle forms, or all your practice is very slow qigong, you won't really have cultivated the yin and yang of the body. You need to do both. Um, and very importantly, they may, they risk um, exacerbating the tendency of people to turn inwards. So if we're very self-absorbed and actually also uh, depressed, sometimes internal practice doesn't help. It, in a way, it can worsen it because we're kind of cycling around our own inner world. So sometimes, and I knew this when I practiced Chinese medicine, some people who are doing lots of meditation or, or quiet practices actually need to be told to go out and run and play sports and dance and do more external practice. So, as always, the answer, the recommendation, is to balance both. If we want to cultivate ourselves um, to become the, our best selves in terms of this kind of practice, we want to do some internal and some external. That's yin-yang. 
and we balance it according to our age. So obviously young people do more external. Um, as we get older, we go into more internal practice. We balance it according to our physical condition, our health, and so on. So now let's look at breathing. This um, beautiful book, written in the 4th century BCE, is um, a lesser-known Taoist book. M most people know the Tao Te Ching, that's the most famous. This one is less known. It's actually a, it's also called Inner Training. It's a kind of training manual for meditation and internal practice. As for the vitality of all human beings, it inevitably occurs because of balanced, underlined breathing. The reason for its loss is inevitably pleasure and anger, worry and anxiety. Yeah? So when we're calm and centered, free from pesky emotions and breathing calmly, that cultivates our energy and our vitality to its best. So breathing is, is unusual among what are called the autonomic activities of the body. Um, the autonomic functions go on independent of our conscious control, like the beating of the heart, um, the digesting of the stomach, the peristalsis of the intestines, and for most of us, most of the time, breathing. We don't have to consciously remember to breathe. You just go on breathing, so it's an automatic function. But unusually among the um, autonomic functions, breathing is one we can also control. And in the uh, traditional Asian self-cultivation traditions, the ability to consciously control the breathing is used as a powerful tool for transformation, for emotional mental, physical, health and well-being. Okay, so uh, carrying on, on with the Chinese view of the human organism, it's said that the human body has a design fault. Okay, We're alive, that's the problem. And, um, and we stand up, we're vertical. So the design fault is that what the Chinese call qi and blood has a tendency to rise up the body and to, to abandon below and rise up to the top. And when that happens, physically, we get problems like dizziness, um, high blood pressure, uh, strokes, headaches, migraines, um, and weakness and deficiency of the legs below. And these are, again, not confined to older people, but they become more common as we age. So that's what happens on a physical level when Qi and blood go up too much, but on an um, emotional and mental level, what happens is the, okay, I'm trying to explain it, uh, using yin and yang. The idea is that within the body and within the universe, yin and yang embrace each other. Yeah? So in the human body, yin, which is below, embraces yang and prevents it from rising up too much, yeah? holds it down. And this has a particular relevance to the emotions because, um, I don't know if this is getting too Chinese medicine and wacky for you, but it's the relationship between the kidneys which, which embody the idea of water and the heart which embodies the idea of fire. So kidneys dominate below. If the kidneys, if the lower energy is strong, it prevents the fire of the heart from burning out of control. Yeah? It holds it down. So what do we mean when we say the fire of the heart burning out of control? We mean that the mind and the emotions become um, unstable, unanchored. So that gives rise to symptoms like anxiety, excessive thinking, uh, worry, nervousness, um, Insomnia, very importantly, uh, restlessness, an unstable spirit, an un ungrounded spirit. Um, so, no chest breathing. 
chest breathing is the upward and outward uh, movement of the lungs. It's something we do spontaneously at times of great stress and emergency, and we do it when we exercise vigorously. Run, get breathless, <laughs> we breathe into the upper part of the chest. But this has a negative effect on us when we do it, unless it's absolutely necessary. It causes feelings of stress. It raises the center of gravity. That means it brings chi and blood up the body. So as far as the anatomy of the lungs is concerned, the lungs, we have to expand the lungs in order to breathe. And the lungs can expand in three directions. Um, up and down, sideways, and forwards and backwards. But because of the ribs, the ribs constrain the lungs. The greatest area of expansion of the lungs is downwards. Taking the diaphragm down and, and it, breathing into the lower lobes of the lung. That is deep abdominal breathing. That's what it means. So the Chinese internal arts response to this problem <laughs> of um, the tendency of the human body to have everything go up is to lower everything. And we do it physically. Um, we'll do a bit in a minute. We do it physically by dropping the center of gravity, dropping the core, yeah? and rooting down to the ground. And this is something really nearly all human beings are considered to need. So within these traditions, it's very rare to focus energy on the upper part of the body. We don't meditate on the head, we don't focus on the, on the third eye. We root and root and root and root, drop, drop the chi. Yeah? That's uh, um, the absolute foundation of practice. When we're very, very grounded, maybe then we can um, move the mind around the body and into the upper part of the body. So one way is physically by dropping. We actually drop here, we drop the shoulders, we relax the chest, everything goes down, just lengthen up through there. We'll practice this in a minute. Um, so we do it physically and we do it by breathing. And by breathing, what we do is we take the breath down to the lower abdomen and we keep the chest empty. When we breathe, we ignore the chest. The lung is quiet, lung feels quiet, and the heart feels quiet. If you can feel your lung expanding, you're not taking the breath down enough. So, is everybody willing to give it a go? Good. So what we just did, um, the first bit, the breathing, is now used very, very widely in all kinds of situations, including increasingly in the world of psychiatry, in the treatment of severe problems like post-traumatic stress disorder, um, ADHD in children, uh, for survivors of trauma, uh, for survivors of, of sexual abuse and physical abuse, to kind of reset the organism, organism in ways that I hope to be able to explain to you. Okay. Anybody experience any particular effects? Hot. Anybody else feel hot? Okay. So that's a mystery, isn't it, that I'm going to try and explain. Why should breathing make us feel hot? Because it does, often. Okay, so um, science. I have no science background, and I tell you, it was a real struggle <laughs> um, trying to make sense of this stuff. I kept reading incredibly complicated research papers where I had to look up every other word and still didn't understand it. But I've done my best. So um, I'm going to look at we're going to look at three aspects of breathing nitric oxide, carbon dioxide, and heart rate variability and the autonomic nervous system. And they are in ascending level of importance. So I don't know 
how important the nitric oxide aspect is, but it's really interesting. So nitric oxide is a molecule, it's a gas that um, we have in the human body that acts as a vasodilator. So if, just in case you don't know the term, vasodilator means that it causes our blood vessels to relax and open. It's the opposite of vasoconstriction where they tighten up. So it relaxes the blood vessels and um, <coughs> that has the effect of lowering blood pressure and increasing oxygenation in the body. The reason it increases oxygenation in the body is the blood vessels in the lungs relax. That gives them a larger surface area and more able to absorb the oxygen that we breathe in. Okay. So um, we know that uh, nitric oxide helps prevent um, cardiovascular disease, increases blood flow to the brain and has a whole range of other interesting effects on the body. It's um, antifungal, antiviral and antibacterial. It means it helps strengthen the immune system. So um, where do we get it from? Well, first of all, we get it from food. Um, it's found in a variety of foods, particularly um, green leafy vegetables, dark green leafy vegetables, uh, beets, celery, garlic, walnuts, dark chocolate, and more. It's also available in the form of a supplement, much used by athletes and physical trainers. Now they've discovered that it um, enhances blood flow. Um, its production is stimulated by exercise and sunlight. I should mention, by the way, that um, the most popular drug that stimulates nitric oxide is Viagra. So Viagra works by relaxing blood vessels and increasing blood flow. And do you know about nitroglycerin taken for angina? So angina, when you have acute, acute heart pain, take a pill of nitroglycerin, which contains nitric oxide, helps dilate the blood vessels. Yeah. So foods, uh, exercise, sunlight, and breathing. And it's a fairly recent discovery that nitric oxide is um, produced in what are called the paranasal sinuses. Those are the hollows in the skull around the air, the empty spaces. So it's produced there. So when we breathe in through the nose, we inhale nitric oxide, but we don't when we breathe in through the mouth. So nose breathing increases oxygenation by about 20% yeah, compared to breathing through the mouth because we take in nitric oxide from the uh, paranasal sinuses that relaxes and opens the blood vessels in the lung and you get better oxygenation. But what's really interesting especially for you yogis, is um, the, the, the Swedish researchers who first discovered that nitric oxide is produced in the sinuses also discovered that when we hum, the production of nitric oxide increases 20-fold. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what's the most common form of humming in the yoga world? Um, can you feel that nitric oxide producing? And then we inhale it. Huh? Um, and incidentally, this kind of humming is also very good for curing sinus disorders, blocked sinuses and, and so on. Um, secondly, carbon dioxide. So um, if you say to people, breathe deeply, it's good for you. Pe people who don't really know what they're doing, most likely to Okay, that's called hyperventilation. And we do it when we're stressed, we do it when we're anxious. Um, it doesn't increase oxygenation. It actually reduces oxygenation. Okay. But more importantly, it reduces carbon dioxide in the blood. And carbon dioxide is really good for us, up to a point, not too much. So hyperventilation, you're probably aware of this, it leads to all kinds of unpleasant symptoms. The most common is anxiety, feelings of tightness in the chest, feelings of stress, 
um, the blood vessels constrict, that reduces oxygenation, blood pressure goes up, and there's less blood flow to the brain, and that affects our ability to um, attend closely to what's going on, to concentrate, and to function effectively. So what happens to people is they encounter a stressful situation, they hyperventilate, and they get less able to deal with the situation. They get less, but worse, their judgment is worsened. Okay? So what's the remedy for acute anxiety, common remedy, due to hyperventilation? Breathe in and out to, uh, into a paper bag. So you don't take in any more oxygen, you just recycle the carbon dioxide from exhaled air, and that will settle because um, carbon dioxide vasodilates. It dilates the blood vessels and increases oxygen to the brain and the heart, lowers the blood pressure and calms the nervous system. Okay, so when we did slow, deep breathing just then, did the rate we were breathing at, did it make anybody feel, should we say, a little bit air hungry? You know, w without going at that rate, you would have spontaneously inhaled sooner, yes? So when you feel a little bit air hungry, that is a sign telling us that we've actually increased carbon dioxide, because it's the presence of carbon dioxide in the blood that stimulates breathing. So we've deliberately increased carbon dioxide. The effect of that, one of the effects, is to dilate the blood vessels. And that's why we feel warm. We feel hotter. Yeah? When I do a Qigong class, first thing I do is open all the windows. Because if we stand for five minutes, slow breathing, I get hot and I'm not bothered about anybody else. It's, it's my class. <laughs> no, generally speaking, everybody gets, everybody gets hot. Okay, so now we get to the complicated bit. I hope you're going to stay with me on this because it's really interesting. This is the bit everybody's terribly excited about nowadays, particularly in the field of psychiatry, is the relationship between what's called heart rate variability and the autonomic nervous system. And I hope to explain it in a way that is clear. So the first thing to understand, the heart is not a metronome. It actually used to be believed that the heart should be a metronome. It used to be believed that um, exact, precise heartbeat rhythm, that every beat is the same, was a good thing. That's what a metronome does. And then suddenly they discovered that was completely wrong. So they turned it around 180 degrees and um, realized that metronomic heartbeat, that's where every beat is the same distance apart, is really, really bad sign. What is desirable is heart rate variability. So you see that there's varying distances between the heartbeats, longer distance, shorter distance, or shorter time, rather. So this is called heart rate variability. When we have a high rate of heart rate variability, that means the rhythm changes, rather than being metronomic, that is an indication of a healthy nervous system, a healthy cardiovascular system. It's an indicator of youth. Young people have higher heart rate variability. People who are fit have heart, higher heart rate variability. It's considered to be a sign of um, a flexible and adaptive physical and emotional organism. We respond to changing circumstances more effectively. We better, have better attention, better listening, and better communication skills. It's associated with those. And low heart rate variability, so where the beats are you know, too similar in timing apart, is associated with disease, cardiovascular disease, being unfit, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, anxiety and depression, ADHD, aggressiveness, stress, uh, inflexible behavior, worry, irritable bowel syndrome, and all-cause mortality. That means you're more likely to die sooner if you have low heart rate variability. And 
This is because the heart rate responds to and is an external indicator of the state of the autonomic nervous system. So um, some of you be work very well up on the autonomic nervous system, um, remembering everything you learned at school, and some of you perhaps have forgotten one or two things. I'm just going to explain a little bit about the autonomic nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system is divided into two branches. A yang branch, which is the sympathetic nervous system, and a yin branch, which is the parasympathetic nervous system. And let's talk first about the yang branch, the sympathetic nervous system. This is traditionally known as the fight or flight response. So when something, even when a, a, a car backfires in the street, we'll go into sympathetic nervous response. Or we hear a bang, maybe a car crash. Or somebody threatening comes towards us. Or we're walking in the mountains and we meet a bear. We instantly, without thinking, automatically go into sympathetic state. Our heart rate will increase. Our pupils will open so we can see danger more clearly. Um, our stress hormones will go up. Um, the blood vessels will contract, will breathe faster, and will become hyper alert to danger. That is one way of describing it. That's absolutely true, but it's wider than that. Um, when we experience stress in our lives, we go into sympathetic state. Yeah? We might deliberately go into sympathetic state when we are excited or want to be excited. When we go to a movie, and it's really exciting. We'll go into sympathetic state. Our heart will speed up. Yeah? You can feel it. Our blood vessels will contract. When we challenge ourselves to do difficult or dangerous things, we go into sympathetic state. But, so that's all good. It's a protective mechanism, and it's an enjoyable thing if it's not out of control. The problem is that the sympathetic state goes out of control. It becomes a pattern. Uh, and pathologically, if we are in excessive sympathetic state, we're experiencing constant stress, fear, anxiety, defensiveness, worry. Um, we find it difficult to get close to people. We have poor judgment, poor reasoning. We feel threatened. Um, we have a freeze response. I'll talk about that again in a moment. Um, we experience post-traumatic stress disorder and flashbacks. That's what happens when we have our organism is set excessively in the sympathetic state. And that's how a lot of us are. A lot of people are. People say it's modern life that gets us like that. It's probably always been that. We have a tendency to be in that kind of state. And it's really bad for us because when we're in the sympathetic state, it's designed to... Uh, it's often described as like the accelerator in a car. It's designed to burn energy faster, to give us stimulus. That creates inflammation and causes um, cell damage due to free radicals. And if we're stuck in the sympathetic state, or we spend too long in the sympathetic state, the, the body's ability to repair cells can't keep up with cell damage. And this kind of low-level inflammation is now increasingly understood to underlie um, most of the serious chronic diseases, heart disease, um, strokes, dementia, cancer, and so on. OK, that was the sympathetic. Now we have the parasympathetic, the yin branch of the autonomic nervous system, also called the rest, relax, and digest branch. And when parasympathetic um, nervous system dominates, our blood vessels relax and open, heart rate and blood pressure go down, the immune system is enhanced, the body is in a self-nourishing state and a repairing state, anti-inflammatory pathways are activated to counter the negative inflammatory effects of the sympathetic state. So the mind and body calms down, and we spontaneously feel safe. We have feelings of trust, safety, relationship, 
closeness, affection, um, and enhanced flow states. Um, so I just want to um, digress for a moment and just mention um, a guy called Stephen Porges, um, I'm not quite sure how you pronounce his name, who is the originator of what's called the polyvagal um, theory. Vagal refers to the vagus nerve, the really important vagus nerve that runs from the brain right down, wandering vagabond nerve, wandering down through the body, through all the main organs of the body, sending messages between the brain and the body, and even more sending messages from the body to the brain. And he's tied the vagal nerve to our evolutionary defense systems. So what he says is that the most primitive defense system, which is reptilian, comes from the age of evolutionary age of reptiles, is the freeze response. So we've got a pond in our garden, we have frogs, we also have cats. When the cats catch the frogs, the frogs play dead. Yeah? So lots of reptiles do that. But we've got that reptilian response in us. So quite often, probably all of you read about accounts of women being um, abused by Harvey Weinstein. What commonly happens in those situations, some women will just slap him around the face and walk out. But a lot of people in those situations of sexual abuse or threat go into freeze response. Yes? They're paralyzed. They don't know what to do. They can't run away. They can't fight back. It'll happen when, if you, you know, when the London Bridge attacks. Some people see the situation quickly and run. Other people just stay frozen. So Porges says he has a lot of clients as a psychiatrist, a lot of clients who have been abused and feel a deep sense of shame that they didn't respond uh, by fi fighting or by fleeing. And he says to them, look, you responded in the best defensive way you could. You're not strong enough to fight. You couldn't flee, so you did the, the only thing o open to you, which is freeze. You should be pleased. <laughs> it's a very reassuring thing to say. Okay. So evolutionarily then, uh, mammals developed uh, the sympathetic nervous response. That's fight or flight. Okay. That's obviously very clearly a defense system. But what I find really interesting about what he says is that the, the highest level of defense is um, the parasympathetic state that works through the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve travels to the larynx and to the facial muscles and to the ears. Okay? And it affects our facial expression it affects our listening ability, and it affects our speech. So when we're in parasympathetic, when humans are in parasympathetic state, our facial expression is communicating to other humans, and also incidentally to dogs, I don't know whether you know that, because dogs sit there and look at humans' faces to see how they're feeling. We communicate safety. Yeah? I hope right now I'm communicating safety to you, and you're communicating safety to me. That's the great strength of Homo sapiens. This defense system is a cooperative, reassuring, mutual trust situation. We listen to each other. We're ability, you know, we show, if we're not listening, if somebody's not listening to you, that's already a threat. Yeah? And thirdly, and I think really importantly, it affects our speech. So it affects volume, tone, and uh, what they call prosody. And prosody is the kind of rhythm of our speech. So when we're in genuine parasympathetic mode, we are communicating to others, to our friends, to our family, to our children. If you're a doctor, you're communicating to your patients. It's safe here. Yeah? You can relax. You can trust this situation. So it's a very powerful um, healing tool. Okay, so how does this autonomic nervous system um, relate to what we're talking about, heart rate variability going up or down? So 
Um, when we know that when sympathetic, we go into sympathetic nervous system state, the heart rate goes up. When we go into parasympathetic state, it slows down. So heart rate variability is an external measure, in fact it's the only external measure that yet, has yet been discovered of the state of the autonomic nervous system. Huh? We don't actually know, there's no physical measure of what's going on in the autonomic so nervous system apart from heart rate variability. So if you're interested now you can go and look online, you can go to somebody who specializes, you can go and have to biofeedback heart rate variability, you can see your heart rate variability on a screen and you can play around with what improves heart rate variability and that's improving your um, sympathetic, parasympathetic flexibility. So we need a healthy, balanced, autonomic nervous system and for most of us that means that we need to train the parasympathetic state. Yeah? You will get a few people who walk around in constant parasympathetic state, maybe <coughs> a little bit stoned, a little bit dozy. We don't want to be like that. I don't want to be like that. But on the other hand, I don't want to be... Yeah? I want to have flexibility between the two. I want balance. I want to be internally quiet, calm and relaxed, but also able to function clearly and effectively in the world. Yeah? I understand the balance between the two. So for most of us who risk, especially in modern life, being in sympathetic state, we need to train the parasympathetic state. We want to be able to go into sympathetic state when we need to or when we want to and then quickly revert back. Our default mode is parasympathetic. Cool, calm and collected, yes? As this um, lovely book called Vegetable Root Discourses, Discourse says, the cool eye discerns men's character, the cool ear hears the intent in their speech, cool emotions plumb others' feelings, the cool mind penetrates everything. Yeah? That's a way of operating very effectively in the world, knowing what's going on. And this flexible uh, autonomic nervous system is said to build stress resilience. That means it builds our ability to respond to stressful events, to recover quickly from them, rebound from them. So, if we want a balanced autonomic, system, um, autonomic nervous system that's reflected in high heart rate variability, what's the best way of getting it? And this is cl closing sort of getting towards the closing conclusion of this talk. So relaxation, meditation. Interestingly, they did a study. People who meditate regularly have higher heart rate variability. That's a more um, effective autonomic nervous system than elite athletes when they're resting. Huh? What they'll tell you is you need, what Western exercise will say, you need to be very fit and do loads of aerobics to get high heart rate variability. Meditation get, does it even better. Uh, rhythmic muscle lengthening. This is just a small amount of research, but very interesting to me as a Qigong practitioner, because in Qigong, like we did this one, at the same pace as we're breathing, we slowly elongate the muscles and the fascia of the body and slowly release it back. And this rhythmic lengthening and releasing we now know increases heart rate variability. That means it um, balances out the autonomic nervous system. But above all, what's the most effective way of promoting the parasympathetic state and balancing the autonomic nervous system? You know why we're here? <laughs> Slow, deep breathing. Yes. The easiest and quickest way for humans to activate the parasympathetic nervous system and raise heart rate variability. It appears to work for all of us, all human beings, quickly, rapidly. Breathe slowly, heart rate variability increases. 
parasympathetic state is enhanced. It tells the brain that all is well as compared to rapid breathing, um, which evokes a stress response. So, what speed should we breathe is the question. If we talk about slow breathing and the parasympathetic response, what has been discovered through lots of different pieces of research, initially starting with research into yoga breathing, that was where all this research started, is that when we slow our breath down um, to between four, four and a half to six breaths a minute, what happens is we enter what's called a coherent state. It's somehow like an optimum balanced state of the human organism where as we breathe in, heart rate goes up. That's because when we breathe in, we activate the sympathetic nervous system. And when we breathe out, we activate the parasympathetic calming nervous system and heart rate slows down. We breathe in, it goes up. We breathe out, it goes down. This is called respiratory sinus arrhythmia when this pattern occurs. And what's actually happening when we do this is if you add on to that our blood pressure, our blood pressure is going like this. It's a what they call a coherent state they've discovered. So the optimum rate, well, the average optimum rate for humans is five and a half breaths a minute. So we were breathing when we did that practice somewhere between five and six breaths a minute. Uh, that means when we say um, five breaths a minute, that means um, six seconds in, hailing, and six second, seconds exhaling. It's 12 seconds, five breaths a minute. Uh, but it does vary. You can go and have your, as I said, you can go and be hooked up to a biofeedback machine and find out your personal optimum rate because it will show as uh, the rate that you breathe that maximizes this. Uh, but a general rule is that men and tall people, their optimum rate is slower. So maybe 4.5 breaths a minute. And women and shorter people a bit higher, 5.56 breaths a minute. And when we do that, breathing at our optimum rate increases heart rate variability tenfold from say a four beat difference timing to 35 to 40 beat difference. And remember, that's an indicator of a very healthy and responsive autonomic nervous system. Um, if we want to further stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system even more, at the risk of getting a little bit dozy, a little bit too peaceful, we can exhale against resistance. That means we can sing, we can play the didgeridoo. It's <laughs> always said about the didgeridoo, the people who are playing it have much more fun than the people who are listening to it. Um, we can chant. So uh, it's really interesting when they've done research on monks chanting, they're usually chanting at around five or six breaths a minute, naturally and spontaneously. Playing wind instruments. Um, and uh, you, there are people teaching a way of breathing that you just create a bit of resistance in your throat. And that's enough to further stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. The other thing you can do is um, increase the amount of time breathing out compared to breathing in. Breathing in, the sympathetic is activated breathing out the parasympathetic. That's why we sigh. Yeah. <sighs> That's stimulating the parasympathetic, calming nervous system. Or we can just really slow our breathing down. I, when I do standing qigong, I've timed it, I can get to about three breaths a minute, but some yogis go down to one breath a minute. So it's very, very strong parasympathetic stimulus. You wouldn't be in a very good state to <coughs> escape from a tiger when you've been doing one breath a minute. And um, 
just a word about blood pressure. Slow breathing lowers blood pressure both short and long term. It's the only non-drug treatment approved by the United States Federal Drugs Administration, FDA. Um, so if you have high blood pressure or you have a friend or a family member, tell them to practice slow breathing of the kind we did. Um, and if you want to get into this and you want to help people, there's hundreds of apps now. Just go to the app store and enter coherent breathing and you get free apps that will time your breathing for you with the sound of the sea or gongs or that. And you can set the speed. Um, you need to do at least 15 minutes of slow breathing three or four times a week. And if you do it more, it's likely to be even more effective. And just since we're talking about um, non-drug treatments, it's interesting, just in passing, that all the drugs that are prescribed for anxiety work by dampening down the sympathetic nervous system, yes? There isn't a single drug that promotes the parasympathetic state. Yeah? Breathing is about, well, breathing, meditation, and so on. These are the only ways we know to promote parasympathetic activity. So if you want to find out more or uh, follow this very interesting thread, I'd recommend, um, first of all, Patricia Gerbarg and Richard Brown there, a couple, a married couple, I think. Uh, they're both uh, psychiatrists working in New York. Patricia Gerbarg is, is absolutely fantastic. If you go on YouTube, you can see lots of interviews where they're in talks. She's a very persuasive woman. They use um, slow breathing for um, all kinds of projects, working with trauma survivors, tsunami survivors, 9-11 survivors, um, and so on. And they wrote a book, nice, cheaply available, The Healing Power of the Breath, which comes with a DVD with instructions of you know, different kinds of breathing. And uh, these are some of the papers they've written, for example, uh, Effects of Yoga Breath Intervention for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, Depression, uh, Yoga Breathing for Vietnam Vets, and so on. Um, and this is Stephen Porges, I mentioned his polyvagal theory. Again, if you go on YouTube, you can see some really, really interesting um, interviews with him. Okay, so just let's do a, a simple conclusion. For at least two and a half thousand years in the Chinese tradition, we quoted from the um, Neya, the book Internal Training, the Taoist book, for at least two and a half thousand years, possibly longer, and um, in the Indian traditions, uh, there's been this knowledge and wisdom that the ultimate form of self-cultivation is to cultivate equally our bodies, our minds, and our breath. And this is a precious thing. Loads of people do it now. As we get terribly excited about all kinds of new practices from acro yoga to, um, I have to be careful here, <laughs> <laughs> not to insult anybody. Let's just check against this wisdom knowledge, are we actually cultivating body, breath, and mind equally? Or are we allowing our yoga practice to just become a form of physical training without cultivating mind and spirit and without cultivating breath? And the magic is delivered, the evidence seems to be the magic is delivered when we combine all three. And particularly what I've try to em emphasize tonight is the importance and the wisdom of traditional methods of slow breathing. Thank you. <laughs>